Okay, so problem one. So Rutherford's model of the atom told us that most of the mass of the atom was concentrated in the nucleus. So mass concentrated in nucleus. Um, and that the nucleus was very small. And positive. And so because atoms were neutral, there was electrons somewhere on the outside, but most of the atom was empty space. And the main evidence that he had was um, the scattering of alpha particles. And he found most went straight through. which told him that it was mainly empty space. And some were deflected a lot. Which meant that there had to be a large concentration of mass. So what it couldn't explain was why if we had negative electrons around the outside and the positive proton in the middle, why didn't the electrons fall into the nucleus? I.e. why are atoms stable? Okay, problem two, um, which says describe one piece of evidence that supports the theory that neutral particles in a nucleus are not electron-proton pairs. Okay, so we're showing that we don't just have a proton and electron confined together inside the nucleus. Now there's quite a few pieces of evidence. One is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can use either form we want. Let's take delta P delta X is greater than or equal to H bar on 2. And from this, we can calculate the velocity of the little electron here, which is confined in the nucleus. So assume the nucleus, nucleus is 10 to the minus 15, uh, 10 to the minus 15 meters long because that's approximately the size of a nucleus. In that case, we've got that delta P is greater than or equal to h bar over 2 delta x, which is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. That's h, and then to get it as h bar, I divide it by 2 pi. Then I've got this factor of 2 here still, and my delta x, that's my nucleus, because I'm confining my electron to my nucleus. So, Solving this on the calculator, I get 5.27 times 10 to the minus 20. And now what we're talking about here is electrons. So the mass of an electron is equal to 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So now the momentum would need to be less than its uncertainty if we were to know what it was. So let's take that the momentum is equal to the uncertainty in the momentum. In that case, the momentum is equal to 5.27 times 10 to the minus 20. And so because momentum is equal to mv, this tells us that the velocity of the electron which is confined inside the nucleus is given by p on m, which is 5.27 times 10 to the minus 20 over 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31. And solving this, I end up with 5.78 times 10 to the 10 meters per second, which obviously can't be the case because this is faster than the speed of light and nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Electrons most certainly cannot. So this tells me that A, this calculation's wrong. I'd need to use my relativistic form of momentum 
But secondly, we can't have an electron traveling at relativistic speeds and yet confined within the nucleus. So this tells us that electrons can not be confined to the nucleus. So something else must be going on. Okay, this is problem three. And in this problem, we're asked to calculate the ratio of the longest wavelength line in the Barmer series to the longest wavelength line in the Lima series, and then the same for the shortest wavelength. So in order to do this, we need to know what the Barmer series is. So the Barmer series is when, in hydrogen, when we transition from a higher state to the n equals 2 state. Or we can transition from n equals 2 to the highest state. And for the Lyman series, this is from our highest state to the ground state, which is n equals 1. And we know that the energy of a specific state is given by minus m e to the 4 over 8 epsilon naught h squared times 1 on n squared, which is equal to that's n squared, minus 13.61 electron volts times 1 on n squared. Okay, and so the transition frequency, that's equal to the energy of the final state minus the energy of the initial state. So we need to calculate the ratio of the longest wavelength. So longest wavelength implies the smallest transition frequency. Okay, so this is the transition frequency here, and that's because the transition frequency is equal to hf, which is equal to hc over lambda. So lambda gets longest when the transition frequency is the smallest. Okay, so if we want to calculate the longest wavelength line in the Barmer series, this will be the smallest transition energy so that will be the smallest change in the number of states so we'll want to transition from n n equals 3 to n equals 2 could be back the other way if we wanted to get the the wavelength it's the same wavelength in either case but one's an absorption and one's an emission okay so in this case our change in energy is equal to minus 13.61 electron volts times, so we're doing E n final minus E n initial. So we've just got the minus 13.61 electron volts in both case. And then we've got one over n final squared minus one over n initial squared. So this is equal to minus 13.61 final states two. So that's one over four minus one over nine. And so this is equal to minus 13.61. This is in electron volts. And then we're giving it a common factor. So 4 times 9 is 36. And then I've got 9 minus 4. So that's over 5. And that's electron volts. Okay, so I can then say, well, the wavelength is equal to hc over delta e. So the longest Balmer wavelength I'll put Barma B, longest L there. So then we've got HC over this, which is minus 13.61. And then I've got 5 on 36 on the bottom. So that's equal to HC times 36 over minus 13.61 times 5. Okay, so that's for the Barma, the longest wavelength in the Barma series. For the Lyman series, we'll be transitioning from the closest level to n equals 1 down to n equals 1. So that'll be from n equals 2 down to n equals 1. So this will be delta E is equal to minus 13.61 electron volts times, again, 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. But in this case, the final is 1, and the initial is equal to 1 over 2 squared. So this is 1 minus a quarter. So this is equal to minus 13.61 electron volts times 3 quarters. 
So once again, I've got lambda in this case. Now this is for the Lyman series, and again, this is the longest. So just the same here, except that my energy is now minus 13.61 times three on four. So this is equal to HC over minus 13.61 times three on four on the bottom. So that ends up as minus four on the top and times, sorry, times four on the top and times three on the bottom. And now what I'm wanting is the ratio of these things. That's what the question asked me. So it asked me for the ratio of the bar mass. So what I want is lambda BL over lambda Lyman longest. And so this is equal to HC times 36 over minus 13.61 electron volts times five over this thing, which is HC over minus 13.61 times four times three. Okay, so common factors cancel. These HCs cancel, minus 13.61 electron volts cancel. So my units are canceling there as well. And so I end up with 36 on five times three on four. And solving this, I end up with 27 on five as my ratio for those two wavelengths. So that's for the longest wavelengths. For the shortest wavelengths, I'm going to require my largest transition energy. So in both these cases, this is going to be from the highest possible state. So this tells us that the initial state is going to be the infinite state, which is the unbound state. Um, so what I'm going to have in these two cases is, again, I'll get my um, transition energy this way. So again, I'll do Balmer on this side and Lyman on this side. But now it's going from minus 13.61 electron volts. And now my final state is going from the infinite state down to, um, well, in Balmer, n equals 2, Lyman, n equals 1. And so my final state is 1 over 2 squared. And then my initial state is this infinite state. 1 over infinity, that is equal to 0. And so this is equal to 1 quarter times 13.61 electron volts. Negative. Okay, so if it's transitioning down, then it's releasing this photon. And so then lambda, barma, and I'll put S for shortest there, is equal to, once again, I do HC divided by this thing. So I end up with this four on the top and then minus 13.61 electron volts on the bottom. And for the Lyman series, I've got minus 13.61 electron volts times one on one squared minus one on infinity squared. And so this is equal to minus 13.61 electron volts. And so, Lambda, lambda, uh, lambda Lyman shortest is equal to minus HC. Again, we're just substituting into here, HC divided by delta E minus 13.61 electron volts. And so our ratio, so our ratio, we've got lambda Barma shortest over lambda Lyman shortest is equal to minus HC, well, 4HC over 13.61 electron volts over minus HC over 13.61 electron volts. This cancels, this cancels, and so I end up with 4. Okay, so this is problem 4. We're asked to calculate A, the energy B, the magnitude of the momentum and then see the wavelength as an electron in hydrogen goes from the n equals 3 level to the n equals 1 level. So when the electron jumps down from n equals 3 all the way down to n equals 1, it's going to release a photon. So this is an emitted photon. So 
So the energy of the photon is going to be equal to the energy difference between these two states. So n equals 1 is at a lower energy. So we'll have the energy of the initial state minus the energy of the final state. And so we know that in hydrogen, the energy of a level is given by minus me to the 4 over 8 epsilon naught squared h squared times 1 on n squared. And so substituting in numbers on the calculator or remembering, this part here of the expression is equal to 13.6 electron volts. So this is equal to minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. Okay, so to calculate the energy here, n's 3 for this state and n equals 1 for this state. So the energy which is emitted is equal to minus 13.6 over 9 minus minus 13.6 over 1. And this is all in electron volts. So divided by 9 because that's 3 squared. Divided by 1 because that's 1 squared. And so solving this, we get 12.1 electron volts is the energy of the photon which is released. We could also give it in joules. If we want to convert that to joules, we times by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. And so in this case, it's equal to 1.94 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Okay. So that's part A, we've calculated the energy of our emitted photon. Now it's actually easier to do part C and calculate the wavelength before we calculate the magnitude of the momentum. So let's do C. To do C we can use E equals HF where uh, using C is equal to F lambda we have H times C on lambda. So this tells us that lambda is equal to HC on E. Okay, so H, that's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, times C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by E, 1.94 times 10 to the minus 18. We need this E in joules here. So solving this, we end up with 102 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, or we can write it as 102 nanometers. Okay, so now we've got the wavelength. Now to get the momentum, we can use that the momentum is equal to h over lambda. So this is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 over 102 times 10 to the minus 9. And solving this, we end up with 6.47 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms meters per second as the magnitude of the momentum. Problem 5. So you wouldn't get this problem in an exam. It's mathematically quite challenging. So what we're asked is to show that P of R, which is the probability of finding a particle at radius R, is equal to 4a cubed times r squared e to the minus 2r on a is normalized. So something is normalized if when we sum it up over all values it adds to 1. So mathematically it's normalized if the integral of p of r dr between 0 and infinity is equal to 1. So what we're going to need to do is integrate this. So we've got that the integral of 4 on a cubed r squared e to the minus 2 r on a dr between 0 and infinity. We need to evaluate this. So let's pull the 4 on a cubed out the front because that's a common term. And then we've got 0 to infinity r squared e to the minus 2 r on a dr. And now what we're going to need to do is use integration by parts. So what integration by parts tells us is that the integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. 
So in this case here, sorry, this case here, we'll want to set u is equal to r squared, this part, and then this rest of it is equal to r dv, and dv is equal to e to the minus 2r on a dr. Okay, so we need to find out what du is for this part. So we've got du dr is equal to 2r. And in order to get v, so note that we could write this as dv dr is equal to e to the minus 2r on a. So now what we want to do is get v. And so we need to integrate this with respect to r. So when we do that, we end up with e to the minus 2r on a. And then we have to multiply it by minus a on 2 because then when we differentiate this we end up with this back here okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to use this integration by parts with these expressions here so we've got our 4 on a cubed out the front still and now we've got uv u is r squared v is equal to minus a over 2 e to the minus 2r on a and then we've got minus the integral of v du so this is the integral of v which is equal to minus a over 2 e to the minus 2r on a times du which is equal to 2r dr because like we did with this one we can write this as du is equal to 2r dr okay so now we've got 4 over a cubed let's simplify this a little bit we've got minus r squared a on 2 e to the minus 2 r a and now we've got plus let's pull the a on 2 out the front the integral of e to the minus 2r on a times, oh sorry, we shouldn't have pulled that 2 out the front because that 2 cancels with that 2. So let's get rid of this 2 out the front. So we've got a e to the minus 2r on a times r dr. Now what we're going to need to do to solve this integral is once again employ our integration by parts. So in this case We'll let u equal r, so du dr is equal to 1, and we'll let dv equal e to the minus 2r on a dr. So dv is the same as it was before, so v is going to be once again minus a on 2, e to the minus 2r on a. Okay, so now we can say that the integral of a times e to the minus 2r on a r dr is equal to a times now uv again so we've got u which is r times v which is minus a on 2 e to the minus 2r on a sorry i've left off the on from there and then we've got minus v du so the integral of v which is minus a over 2 e to the minus 2 r on a times du and our du is just equal to dr in this case because this we can just write du equals dr okay so let's put the a inside we've got minus r a squared on 2 e to the minus 2 r on a plus we can pull the a on 2 out the front, the integral of e to the minus 2 r on a dr. And so this is equal to minus r a squared on 2, e to the minus 2 r on a. Plus, okay, now integrating this one, we've got a on 2 e to the minus 2 r on a when we integrate this we did it here and we got that this was equal to times minus a on 2. okay so this expression is equal to minus r a squared on 2 e to the minus 2 r on a 
minus a squared on 4, e to the minus 2r on a. Okay, so let's just color this up a bit to show what we've got. We've just calculated that part and we found out that it's here. This part needed to slot back in here. So what we're going to do is go back to this expression here now. We'll write this down here. So we've got that this thing, which was our integral from 0 to infinity of p of r dr. We've got that's equal to 4 over a cubed. Now here we've got minus r squared a on 2, e to the minus 2r on a. And then we've got this expression here, which is here. So this is equal to minus r a squared on 2, e to the minus 2r on a, minus a squared on 4, Sorry, we've lost a factor of a here. So when we were expanding this brackets, that should have been an a squared because it's a times a on two. So that's a squared. And so this one here becomes a cubed. So this is times a cubed e to the minus two r on a. Evaluating between zero and infinity. Okay, so let's simplify this a little bit. If we move the 4 inside, then we've got 1 over a cubed. And every single term has an e to the minus 2ra in it. So let's put e to the minus 2r on a as a common factor. And then we've moved the 4 inside. So that gives us 2r squared a plus 2ra squared plus a cubed which we're evaluating at infinity and zero. Okay, now when we substitute infinity in here, what we've got is minus a cubed, and then we've got an exponential, which is going to the power of minus infinity. So this goes to zero very quickly. These r squared and r terms are going to infinity, but powers increase much slower than this exponential decreases. So the exponential wins out and when we substitute in infinity into these terms here, we end up with zero. So then we need to substitute in zero. So then we've got plus e to the minus two times zero on a and then it's times two times zero a plus two times zero times a squared plus a cubed. Okay, so timesing by zero, that's zero. Timesing by zero, that's zero. When we do an exponent to the power of zero, we end up with one. So this is equal to one on a cubed times one times a cubed. So we end up with one. So we've just shown now that the this integral, when we integrate it between zero and infinity, is equal to one. So that's shown that this is normalized. Okay, so this is problem six. So in this problem, we're told that the electron has a quantum number n is equal to three. And we're asked to consider L, ML, that's the projection of L, S and MS. And how many electrons can fit into the n equals three level of the atom? And how does this relate to the periodic table. Okay, so if n equals three, then L, this goes from zero up to n minus one. So this tells us that L can equal zero, it can equal one, or it can equal two. Now ML, these are the projections of L. So when L is zero, it's zero. When L is minus one, then we've got ML is minus one, zero, and one. And when L is two, we've got ML is equal to minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. So ML goes between minus L all the way up to plus L. Okay, now for electrons, they have spin one half. So for all these states, S is equal to a half. And then ms, that's the projection of the spin, it can be um, plus one or minus a half. So there's 
two spin options there. Okay, so to work out how many different electrons can fit into n equals 3, with l equals 0, we've got um, just the one l equals 0 and ml state, and then we've got two spin projections. So in l equals 0, there's two electrons. In l equals 1, we've got the three projections. So there's three here, and then each of those can have two different spin projections. So there's three times two, which is six electrons. And then for L equals two, we've got the five projections of ML. And each of those five projections has two spin projections. So that's five times two, so that's ten electrons. So in total, in n equals 3, we've got the 18 electrons. Okay, so in terms of the chemistry, these two electrons are the two s electrons. These ones are the 6p electrons, and these ones are the 10d electrons on our periodic table. Okay, so this is problem 7. And we're asked to draw energy band diagrams for a metal an insulator and a semiconductor. Okay, so in a metal, what's special about this is that we've got a partially filled band. So let's draw our bands, if these are the bands here, and we'll use green to fill them. So this one here is a filled band, and then we've got a partially filled band here. So there's plenty of room in this band for the electrons to move. So we've got a filled band, an empty band, and a partially filled band. Now in an insulator, we've got an empty band up here. and a filled band down here. And below that we've got more filled bands. So let's color these ones in to show that they're filled. So these are all full, all full. And what makes this one an insulator is that we've got a relatively large energy gap here. So there's quite a large energy gap. And then with a semiconductor, it's similar except that it's got a much smaller energy gap between the filled bands and the empty band. So here's our filled bands here, here's our filled bands here, and we've got this energy gap here, but it's small. And here it's large. So around about five electron volts, at least in this case. In this case, they're smaller than around about five electron volts. Okay, and then we're asked to label the valence and conduction bands. So with a metal, it doesn't really make much sense to talk about valence and conduction bands because we've got this partially filled band. So this band here can conduct. But in general, we wouldn't call it a conduction band. Okay, so the highest filled band, that's the valence band, and up here is our conduction band. And same in our semiconductor. Okay, so the differences are with this one, we've got a partially filled band. With this one, the insulator, we've got a large energy gap between, um, fill, well, let's call them valence and conduction band. And here we've got a small gap, energy gap between valence 
and conduction band. Okay, so this is problem A. And we're told that a material can conduct and its resistance decreases as it's heated. And what type of material is it? Okay, so is it a metal? Is it a um, insulator? Or a semiconductor? Okay, so it can conduct. So it could be a metal, it couldn't be an insulator, as these don't conduct, it could be a semiconductor. And then as the temperature increases, resistance decreases. So with a metal, the resistance actually increases as the temperature increases. So this is not true for a metal. Insulators don't conduct. And for a semiconductor, this is true as more of the electrons can jump, use the thermal energy to jump into the conduction band. So we have more conducting electrons as the temperature increases. So in this case, this must be a semiconductor. This is a semiconductor. Conductor. This is problem nine. And we're asked to draw an energy level diagram for a P type semiconductor. So, with any semiconductor, we've got a conduction band and then we've got a valence band. And so the valence band is filled with electrons. And the conduction band is essentially empty. Okay, and we are asked for a P-type semiconductor. So a P-type semiconductor has extra acceptor atoms in it. So it effectively has an acceptor level here, just above the valence band, which can accept electrons from the valence band. So what happens is electrons can jump from the valence band up into this acceptor level here. And when they do so, they leave behind a hole. So we've then got holes in the valence band and these holes can then move around and conduct the current. So a P-type semiconductor is one with this extra acceptor level here. So a P-type semiconductor has an acceptor, acceptor level just above the valence band.